Um, my recording. I should have done like a, what is it? Action. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thing. I don't know how to do it. It, it totally asked me if I wanted to stay or leave. Like, you've been recorded. Are you okay with it? Oh, really? Did it? <laughs> That's clever. Yeah. That's good. Um, consent. Good. Um, so, uh, thank you, Wasi, for taking the time to be with me today. Um, we'll have a little conversation. I've been doing these. Uh, talk to the camera things um, about, I've done about four, I think now. Um, and they, I guess, kind of came out of incubating during this strange time that we're in and feeling like um, the need to showcase some of the awesome women in my life and in particular, some of the awesome women in um, the We Will Lead Africa volume two um, that you are part of. And so I've done a few, which are just me speaking at the camera, but I thought, why not begin to invite some of our contributors in? So thank you for being the first person to join us here today. Um, I'm going to do a little intro, and then um, I'll ask Wasi some questions so we can hear all of the wisdom that you've got to share with us. So this series is focused on this book. So it's volume two of We Will Lead Africa, and it's a collection of stories just by African women who are doing awesome and extraordinary things um, across the African continent um, and having lots of impact in, in all the different ways and places that, that they are. Um, Wasi's here in Mozambique, where I'm also based, um, but unfortunately we're not face-to-face -face today, uh, although we <laughs> often are. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and read a little bit from the book. But suffice to say, and you can say it in your own words, suffice to say that uh, alongside all of the other awesome women in this volume, Wasi is also one of those multifaceted ones that have lots of different parts to what they do and who they are. <laughs> um, some of them are creative, designer, healer, um, and in particular, storyteller um, through all of those different mediums. And so, um, I think that comes across really strongly at the start of your story. So I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning and then a little bit from the end, and then I will hand over to you. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Okay. So the story goes, Karingana wa Karingana can be translated loosely as once upon a time. It is how elders seated around a fire began their stories in the old days in Mozambique. And it is how I start every story that I narrate. This time, it's my own story. There's something powerful that happens to an individual when circumstances force them to live outside of their native country. There's a connection that happens and is best described through the sentiment that in Portuguese language we call saudade. It is the nostalgic longing for a missing, for or missing a place, a person, or a feeling you've previously experienced. It is through that feeling that many times you start to forge an identity that is engraved with nuances of this faraway place. Do you recognize your words? <laughs> I know, I'm like, what? <laughs> did I write that? <laughs> you totally That's did. Me. That's you. I'm like, oh my God, okay, you're not bad. <laughs> I just said that to myself in my, in my head. <laughs> so I wanted to start there because I love these words forge an identity um, and particularly yeah. with those different hats that you wear. I wanted to hear a bit mm -hmm. about what does identity mean for you? <laughs> Straight in. Um, yeah, I started quite big. <laughs> but I think identity is so many things and... Um, most importantly, I think it's it's always transforming itself, right? One day we wake up and we're one person, but we're kind of mutating as life happens. And we're changing and we're learning and we're adapting and we're accepting. Um, so I guess, first of all, I, I recognize myself to be a human. <laughs> um, of course, a woman. Um, somebody who tries to cultivate empathy, um, learning to work on that more, 
I think at times I have more than others. Learning what it is to be um, a creative person who is also a healer and understanding how I can be those two things and how they kind of sometimes um, interchangeable, you know? So I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm learning a little bit, I guess, about my identity. And now I'm learning about how to, how to be this person that exists in this new world that is COVID. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to navigate between, you know, in the beginning, it was very much about self-preservation and being con- completely locked up and sort of saying, hey, um, I need to keep away to stay alive. And then now it's been more about learning how to survive on, um, with this reality, understanding how can you still live and do things and um, function, because I don't think it's going away anytime mm-hmm. soon. So... Yeah, and and I also try. I'm trying to think what it means to be a Mozambican, because Mozambicans aren't like very hard going in this. You know, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't think I have a very strong sense of identity in the sense that I'm an other in, in different places. I think it's, we're so many things at the same time that it's very hard to just place yourself in one, under one flag, for example, right? Um, I'm a Mozambican who grew up in South Africa and in London and in New York and, you know, and, and, and. So I'm all of those things um, and I can, tell distinctively different parts of my being that kind of resonate with those places that I lived in and, you know, that I love. Um, and, um, and I recognize that I'm, because if I was to compare myself to any other Mozambican, I'm also very different because I have lived in all these different places. So I've kind of brought them with me and I wear them in my heart every day. Um, and I, and I think that, that's what's interesting about being a child of the world, right? It's mm-hmm. just you're, you're a sponge and you kind of belong a little bit to different places. Mm-hmm. I, I love how you talk about identity as something that's like constantly in flux or transforming or new, new threads being added all of the time. Um, I think sometimes we can fix ourselves into, into identity in a way that isn't necessarily helpful to us yet it also comes out really strongly in your story that there are these parts of your identity like being Mozambican whatever that means being African being a woman whatever that means Um, and there's a particular part where you talk about becoming unapologetically black Um, yeah mm, talk to me a bit about that and like what I guess particularly in the current context of what's going on in the world that's that's oh america (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) and i think it's funny because i've been reliving that feeling um i think america and a little bit south africa but mainly america taught me about being black because in mozambique we're so blended right we kind of just created this whole we created this bubble in mozambique where we all live and get along and you know you have like Indian friends and mixed friends and white friends and everybody just kind of there's 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 harmony I'm not saying that there are there isn't racism in Mozambique but it's not as heightened and then you go and live in some place like South Africa um, where there's very much a separation right and um, you also live in the U.S. And the U.S. is, whew, it's a beast, right? I think everybody has been following what, what happens in terms of race relations in the U.S. So for you to come to the U.S. as a young Mozambican, who's kind of used to 
not really having these two lines of like black and white, but just accepting that there is many different things and all of a sudden you're put on one side of the road and you have to pick. Um, but also like in the US is where I started to study more about black history and uh, black American history, I think. Um, and slavery can bring up these feelings and they make you very angry at the system that allowed for such inhumane things to happen um, to people that look like us. And I think I started kind of feeling, processing these feelings and kind of say, white people not so very nice, are they? <laughs> I mean, who came up with that? And, and the thing is, it could, you could easily say, oh, okay, this, this was then. But the systems are still in place. And that's the part that hurts the most, is that there doesn't seem to be any rush in dismantling the systems that benefit white America. Mm. Um, and, you know, and we always say, you may not be racist, but you live in a system that benefits you for being white. And you're comfortable with that. So that, in a way, makes you a part of the problem. As long as you, you know, as long as you don't say anything, um, you're part of the problem. And so America was where, you know, I, I started to have these feelings about being black and realizing. And so I came closer. I went from, from actually not really engaging with black America when I first arrived because I was, I was prejudiced. As an African, I was also following all the news and hearing how ghetto black Americans were and everything the media feeds you basically. And kind of taking that for word value and just say, oh God, I'm, I'm different. I'm a different kind of black. You know, I'm a more, I don't know, whatever I thought I was. Until I realized that it didn't really make a difference. When I was walking into a store or, you know, walking on the street and being passed by a cop. Whether I had this British accent and I was from Mozambique did not matter. Mm -hmm. I was just black. And so that kind of forced me into a space where I started to, to kind of immerse myself in black American culture. I joined a sorority. I mean, I think that's like the highest. <laughs> I joined like a whole black sorority. So I think that's like the, the, the deepest you can go into like black American culture. I'm so into that. Um, I think we should do like a whole session, just like stories from <laughs> that time. <laughs> I know. Right. And, um, and I, and I think, and I think it, although it was very painful to realize that I was black or, you know, becoming this black person, it was also very important in creating a sort of pride in who I was in general. And being black made me even prouder to be African, which, you know, it's kind of, um, and, and I made some amazing friends in this journey, sisters, sorority sisters that we have still connected till this day. So I think allowing myself to, to dive into this black American world sort of let me find parts of me that I think I would have never found if I had just been on the sideline. Um, you know, there is this professor that I always say to him, he changed my life. And um, Leo Wilton is this amazing guy, um, black gay man, first ever that I encountered, like, you know, as a figure of authority, right? My professor who I admired so much. Um, definitely shaped a lot of the idea that I had about homosexuality, some of the prejudices that I had growing up. Um, and he just kind of, he was just in our faces with it, right? So he was just like, you can't love me and not love, you know, the whole thing, you know, can't pick and mm -hmm. choose. And I mean, if I was struggling, can you imagine some of the Caribbean guys in our classes? They all loved him, but they were so conflicted and you could tell. And he would just poke at that. And like, you know, he would like bring you stuff that would blow your mind. Like, you know, imagine you're a Q and you're 
and you're very macho and then he's like Langston Hughes which is like a poet who's also a Q. Q is one of the fraternities like black American fraternities and they're known for being like these macho and he's like Langston Hughes is gay <gasps> everybody's like what <laughs> so like he did a lot of those things um but Leo was very important because we studied things like the psychology of racism, the psychology of black thought and adolescent development, which you were talking a lot about the prison industrial system. Mm -hmm. And um, we were reading things like Franz Fanon and Aimé Césaire, which I think all of this literature is so important to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it helps you build an identity and helps you understand also how most of our identity as Africans who came to the Americas, how it was stripped down. Mm -hmm. How did we become one, right? Uh, but still very, very, there's very, a lot of nuances of who we were because if you think about like New Orleans, it's like this French Creole, it's still there, you know, like the Haitian. Um, and, and just in the South, you can still feel like this, the way that they cook and eat and some of the things are very similar. They eat grits, we eat shima, not very different. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, different ways of preparing it. And it was so funny also to find similarities with a lot of the islands, right? I used to, people used to think I was from, from one of the Spanish speaking Caribbean countries. Um, one, because of course, you know, finding somebody who spoke something similar to Portuguese, I was instantly drawn to that. But also the food. They ate a lot of beans. They eat a lot of beans. We eat beans, which, you know, it's, it's like Brazil, Mozambique, beans is like one of the things. So they were like these, I think in, in terms of identity, it's so funny how you can go so far away from home and realize how similar you really are mm -hmm. in the end, right? And we were all driven by the same things, food. So all our cultures were kind of like around food, musicality was a big thing, you know, and this whole communal thing about family. One of the things that I thought was really beautiful about Black America is how they commune around the church, right? Mm -hmm. How the church is the center, um, you know, how they've taken, and also how they've taken the, the, the Catholic church and the white church and kind of transformed it into something else. I've never seen anything like it. I think the only time in my life that I went to church and I actually enjoyed it was in America. Right. Like this, like going to like, you know, these um, Baptist and Baptist church, like the pastor, like felt like the pastor was talking to you, like your uncle was up there giving you a sermon. Mm -hmm. It was like, did you pick me out today? What the hell? But it was like so interesting. And, um, you know, as young, young college um, women, we, we were up there in Binghamton on our own, but we knew that if we needed to, we could go to church and, you know, there was a community that was there for us and they were really there for us. Like we would go to church and, you know, they'd have like Sunday meals. And in the beginning, I didn't really understand, like, I'm not really a church goer, but it was just, I think the, the idea of community was present in that space. Mm -hmm. So these, so, like, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I think I think that's I think that's important, and that's that's what yeah. These like little symbols of um, or connections with home or with belonging or with community. Yeah, with belong belonging, and I think if we think about like the the culture of the sorority, right, about sisterhood. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the reason why I was drawn to it, I think is I've always been a feminist, even before I realized I was a feminist. And the idea of women coming together and this energy that they bring. So the sorority is that we created another, another um, association that was Sister to Hermana. So it was like black and Latina women, and we would come together and discuss different issues. And, uh, I think here I always grew up around very strong circles of women. So this idea of the energy of women in groups, right? Until today I have very much different groups of women that I am drawn to and I, 
I mean, my whole office is women. <laughs> yeah, so we, that comes we don't, strongly in your story as well. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think all of that is, ends up being a part of your identity, right? So realizing, and I think the strongest parts of the things that I hold on to are the injustice that I feel in, in who I am like the way that we are treated as women just because we're women and we're viewed as lesser than because there was a system that was created that benefited men for so many years. So I, I guess people say it's my Aquarian nature to fight against injustice. <laughs> so I think I picked those two battles. Um, you know, one is about defending women on all levels um, of any race actually and the other one is about defending the right to be black and and live freely um and that so that battle comes in different formats depending on where i am in the world um i think that that battle kind of takes on to a class battle here in mozambique mm -hmm. because you would say that we're free but we're not right there's a whole system that creates hierarchies that are unfair um, that benefits those who are in positions of power. Um, not necessarily that was power that was given to them, but they've maintained those systems in place because of benefits. So anything that is about keeping systems in place that only benefit a few bothers me mm -hmm. always. Like, um, there's, I, th I think there's no part of me that can be okay with that. I remember when I came back, I'm not going to say what organization, but when I first came back to Mozambique, I was always asked if I was part of this organization that would afford me the opportunity to do bigger businesses and, you know, be in the right places at the right time. And I was just like, I mean, it sounds nice, but can I really hold and stay? I'm a member of something I don't truly believe in anymore. You know, how is that? I don't know. How is that something that speaks true to me? You know, so I ended up not. And maybe my progress has been slower because of it, but I feel okay. Mm -hmm. um, I feel okay. But yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's, <laughs> there's all of that. So I love, I, I just, I love, I love, I love. <laughs> I could, and I could listen to you talk about it all day, but there's just such a, uh, I don't know, like deep embodied understanding of how different ways we show up and the different parts of our identity are all connected and um, how injustices are therefore also connected, which I think is something that a lot of people kind of struggle with. It's like, wait, which fight am I fighting? The women one or the black one or the African one, or the, right? But the point is, is like they're, they're all completely interlinked and interconnected and the, the things we need to emphasize are different in different settings, right? Um, mm. and, and I really hear you when you say that, sure, the injustice is still are present here um, but it might be a slightly different lens that we take when when we address them in the context of say Mozambique or say an African country or yeah um, mm. I want to hear a bit more about like so the Aquarian that can't rest until <laughs> or whilst there's still injustice like how does that show up in your work how do you link it to what you do on a daily basis um, so there's always this thing, right? The Aquarians tend to be humanitarians in some sort of way. And I mean, it's a very broad way of describing it. But um, I tend to think that my work, it's no accident that I, I mean, I, I do design, but it's sustainable design, right? So I'm worried about the impact that my work has on the planet. I'm worried about the fact that my work my line of work tends to exploit people. So I make sure that I engage with it in a different way. And I want to make sure that my work benefits the people that work within my production, you know, value chain. Um, 
I, I really enjoy working with communities and developing projects and I'm, I'm enjoying right now creating a project for the, for um, Maratan, which is the refugee camp up in the north. I mean, my dream is to create value chains that are completely benefiting marginalized groups in different ways. And by marginalized, I mean, I try to include women. So we're working right now, we, we're making masks and we're working with, you know, um, Mulaid, which is the one for battered, the Association for Battered Women. We're working with um, this other association, Luana Smea Sorizush, which is like the mothers of children with disabilities. We're working, one of my favorite organizations that I just discovered um, that has very little funding and it's like my my dream is to help them. I actually had a dream about them last night. So this is like very much in presently in my thoughts, um, which is Shlaiseka. And Shlaiseka is an association that works with street kids. So they have, um, I call them halfway homes just because that's what they were called in the US. I don't know what they really called. But um, so they have these halfway homes where these street kids can come into. And the ones in the city, so the ones in Altumaya are temporary. So they have one for, for girls and one for boys. And they have kids as young as six and seven year olds, all the way up to 18. And then they have a permanent one in, um, oh, now I'm forgetting the name of the place. They have a permanent one. So what happens is in the temporary ones, you can come in and kind of get a warm meal, take a shower, have a change of clothes, but you're allowed to go back into the street. And a lot of these girls are street workers. So they kind of, you know, they try and educate them and get them to stay, but they don't really say, okay, you have to. But if they decide that they want to stay, then they are moved to a different location and that is in a no, like they're not allowed to leave. They have to accept like the rules and they're accepting a change in their life. And I think it's so amazing that, you know, in a country like this, there are people who are taking their time to look after these kids. Um, and actually this project came about because my mother volunteers with them. And she was like, hey, what can you guys do for the girls? And we need to raise money. And I was like, okay, what do they have? Oh, they have sewing machines, like, perfect. We're about to make masks. Can they, are they any good? Um, so we've been giving them, on every order that we have, they get about 200, 300 masks. We pay 40 metikash per mask. So they've been getting, like, 8,000, you know, mets um, per month. And for them, it's, like, the ladies are, like, when are you coming in? So we need to meet you because... But for us, it's just like, oh, it's just nice that we can actually give you something meaningful to do. So yesterday I had this dream, totally crazy, out of nowhere. I have no idea how that came about. Okay, but it was we like- We both know that it's definitely not out of nowhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> we right. can agree that. But, um, so I had this dream that we had helped my mother build this house for them. And then inside this house, we were running a production unit so it's kind of like a vocational training and they were also producing like bags and other things for us and then and then ha ah, boom so this is totally connected to you because when they left the this halfway home so when they they were old enough to now find a house and we gave them a business in a box right. that was like so it was connected uh -huh. So it was connected. It's so crazy. I was telling Jamila about this dream. So we gave them a business in a box that was connected to like our production. And so they were still part of, so they could start a business and still continue to be part of our value chain from their home. Like they didn't have to, and it would be like their own business. So they would sell it back to us. And I woke up and I was like, what? Okay. And it was super detailed too. So I was just like, um, okay. So, like... <laughs> so that's an invitation for for those who are going to listen to this um 
this the section that Wasi's story is in is in the section of business women and entrepreneurs, even though, as you are hearing, Wasi is so much more than just that. <laughs> um, but uh, another one of the stories is of two other amazing um, Mozambican women, Sara and Tatiana, who started Idea Lab, where I also do some work. Um, so clearly, like, this is us <laughs> concocting <laughs> something <laughs> in the moment. But hi, I Sara. Hi, Tatiana. Sorry <laughs> to bring you into my show. <laughs> I'm going to tag them in this, um, but I want to read this quote, which is at the start of the, of the section that your stories are in. Um, it goes, at every African's heart is an entrepreneurial spirit. We are survivors of struggle, malleable enough to embrace change and celebrate doing things differently. And so I just want to celebrate your entrepreneurial spirit right now and be like, <laughs> You just created a whole value chain and business and, 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 and. <laughs> I know, dream. right? <laughs> but, yeah, I know, in a dream. But like, how perfect would it be? I mean, and I think the thing is, more and more here at Karingana, we, we try and think about circular, the circular economy and circular businesses. So how do you start to create these circular value chains, right? So if you're running a, a um, you know, like a, a, a production unit in this halfway home, then that production unit supports the house, right? So, so there's a circularity in that, in that you, you're creating a way for the house to sustain itself. So it's not something that you have to keep donating to, mm -hmm. but they can keep producing and creating and at the same time training these young kids because you know they have halfway homes for women and for men not wanting to leave these young boys out because leaving these bo young boys out is the kind of thing that brings you the problems that are happening in the north right mm -hmm. we keep doing things for women and we forget the boys um and i think if we start thinking of circular economy and the way that we can create circularity in these places and you know how you can go, for example, to Cabo Delgado and you create an economy and production around the carpets and, and, you know, and you can get more and more people involved in the value chain, which is how we've been trying to do these masks. So what we have proposed, and it, they, it hasn't always been appealing to the clients because it's more expensive, what we propose is that every time they hire us to do masks, we hire a team on location where they are. So there's tailors everywhere in Mozambique. So we've been working with um, trying to get them to, to, to produce in Shai Shai, in Cap Delgado, in Nampula. We're currently working with Marathon. Um, so producing for some people in the, sorry, in the camp, pardon me. And so that, that I think is, is some of the things that we need to change about the way production and business is done in Mozambique because everything is concentrated in Mobutu. Mm -hmm. So if us as business owners start looking for solutions as entrepreneurs, as creatives, start looking for solutions for when our clients order, you know, like 100 keychains in Nampula, don't have them made in Mozambique. There's people who work for, who do woodwork in Nampula. Find a way, even if it's a bit more expensive, to get these keychains made in, you know, in Maput in Nampula, yes. or wherever the client a, is. So a trying, web across the country that brings everything. Yeah, so trying to find trying to find suppliers where they are, so that you are one reducing your carbon footprint because we tend to send things, mm -hmm. um, but two creating value in, um, in these different places and creating opportunities in these different places in the country. Because if, we, if we're talking to the bigger multinationals about local content, but as Mozambicans, we don't, re we don't have the same regard for local content. Local doesn't mean Mozambican. Local means wherever you are. Mm -hmm. That's local. So you can come in and do some training and teach them how to do a few things, but you have to give them the capacity to then continue. You know, um, I always say that, you know, a simple thing to solve some of the, the need for work would be, you know, in my, in my line of work, if you're talking about craftsmanship, 
for example, you have all these big companies that are coming into Bemba, that are coming into Namban and all these gas projects, and they're building houses. If they ordered carpets from the carpet makers in Palma, if they ordered, you know, like baskets from, you know, if they're in Namban, they're ordering that for all the 400 houses that they have. And if they're making like wooden light fixtures from the carpenters around and having their tables and chairs made, that's life changing. Mm -hmm. If they stopped importing the things from South Africa, that would be life changing for those people. Mm -hmm. And the houses would start looking a little bit more like the place where they are, like you know, because yeah. you'd have mm -hmm. items. Um, and I think that can easily be done if we really want to. It's yes. not really like. It strikes me. If that you think about. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It strikes You're me. Saying... That, um, uh, sure, it's challenging. Sure, it might be a bit more expensive. Blah, blah, but the big, the big part that's missing is the either desire or, uh, yeah, willingness um, or even ability to look at this with this this bigger vision right so like what i always when i speak to you is get this like visionary <laughs> kind of uh, archetype coming up for me because you you s speak about big systemic change uh but in really really simple examples and it's like how can we spread more of that way of thinking about um challenges that are local but but let's you know let's have a vision that is uh, beyond just doing it the way we've always done it because they're not working Mm -hmm. it's not it's definitely not working and and i do think that it's simple maybe it's i'm i'm simple in that way but i don't think it's that difficult i think that it, it really didn't take us very long to come up with a system of how we want to make the masks right maybe it's not foolproof but it really was just like okay our client had a request we couldn't travel how could we make it work? Mm -hmm. Technology, right? So, you know, having an online system that works with their phones and it, it doesn't just work with like high tech phones, but any analog phone could like log in information. So like creating these different value chains and also, so we were like, okay, let's tap into working with the NGOs on the ground. Because, I mean, the NGOs on the ground, if you think about it, they always train people for different programs. So there's trained people all around the country that, you know, know how to read and write, and they could do what? Quality control. So they could be the focal point where they collect, you know, the masks and materials and they distribute. And then, so th there's, there's this whole network that's already been created mm -hmm. for other things that in a time such as this can be used or something different <coughs> so let me say it differently so actually so uh what i'm enjoying about hearing the way you conceptualize of all of this is that it's the visionary combined with the like practical feet on the ground it's like we have some stuff let's get going <laughs> right as long as we don't do harm yeah. we can actually begin with what we've got yeah and and that's the thing we have some stuff we started by making masks with our kapulanish, because we had kapulanish, and they were 100% cotton. So for us, it was quite easy because we, we cut the cost of buying raw materials. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so then it, it, it gave us the ability, we've made, I think, throughout this pandemic, I want to say about 20,000 masks so far. Um, and we're not, we're not, we didn't build a, we didn't set up a production unit. Right. We have hired young designers um, from our work with Green is the New Black. We've hired um, different women and tailors that we've worked in the past. Um, because our thought was how, how do we keep them employed during a time where nobody's making clothes? Mm -hmm. And so we created these kits of 100 masks and so each tailor gets 100 masks and the kits include everything already cut so we pre-cut the masks to give them the elastic and you know like the interface everything and they just have to sew it 
And so somebody gets paid to cut and they get paid to sew. It, 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 it means that we have less errors in our masks. Um, and also means that they stay employed, which is uh -huh. like the, uh -huh. the most amazing thing for us um, to be able to provide that. And we also, we're not making a lot of money from this. We barely making like a managing fee, but that's not what this project was about. This project was about saving as many lives as we could and maintaining as many people employed as we could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, it's, and it's taught us a lot about how in the future we could apply this as a business model for us in producing our bags and producing. And so things that we, before we were like, oh, that's how would we work with Palma? Ah, we can, we right. could do masks, we could do. So like it, it, op it opens up to you being able to collaborate with people all over the country, with you being able to create products with different characteristics you know now we're like flying on hey we could have a bag made in ibu and then another one made it yeah yeah yeah, just... yeah right so like all of the things we thought were barriers actually we've we've proven now that we can find ways around them mm -hmm. yeah so that's you know that's that's what we're looking at in you know for the future for us it's like how do we then make this a way of operating Mm -hmm. um so of course in the very i'm i we've been talking for about an hour i think <laughs> <laughs> and so i'm like we should make this into a series because we're only just getting started <laughs> um <laughs> and i could do this for more hours uh but let's stop for today um i'm mm -hmm. gonna put all of the details because i'm sure people will be interested to follow and see all of the awesome things that you're working on so i'll put the details in the description of um karingana wa karingana of green is the new black of whatever you tell me what things you want in there um sure so that people can go and follow and support and buy and all of that stuff uh before we go i wanted to go back to the the theme of sisterhood um mm -hmm. and in your story you talk about a few uh, people along the way a mentor obviously um your co-founder um of your business jamila um but people who've inspired you and and helped you along the way and so let's close with final thoughts on what it means to be part of the sisterhood what it gives to you um, yeah. Um, I think there is nothing more powerful than women supporting women. My very first boss, um, like the first job that I've had here in Mozambique, um, was a woman. And she was just open and taught me everything I know. And she was just very a very exciting person to be around. And you just want to like, you know, soak that up. And then I was lucky enough to meet another woman who was, you know, so the first person that was influenced was Muchimba Deals. And she was, um, so she was my very first boss. And then years later, I met Sara. And Sara was just like, there's something about you. Let me give you some of my time. And here we <laughs> She's are. She's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and um and i was like i had so many ideas and she's like okay so, you know sad is like focus on one and i'm like what no i want to do all of these things um but very patiently i think i was i always say i was client zero to idea lab because we were we would sit in between like her busy work schedule was sitting in her living room and like looking at my numbers and my plans and so it was, this was, I think it was like 2009, 2010. Um, and, and then, you know, and along the years, my business has matured, but I still, I still run to Sada with like every big decision and every big um, hurdle. Um, you know, I think growing in, in the entrepreneurial world is not easy. 
and we've encountered some difficult clients. Jamila and I have gone through change. You know, Jamila has blossomed, I think. She was a lot more closed and she's blossomed into this wonderful businesswoman. And like every, with every relationship, when one person changes and then it changes the dynamic a little bit. So there's like readjustment. I'm like, Sada, I don't know how to deal with this new Jamila. And she was like, uh-uh, just let her, let her be. And I'm like, I know, I, I want to because I, I've wanted this for her for so long. But I just don't know how to deal with it. And so it's been interesting to have those kinds of, and being completely honest and being able to say, I asked for this change for years. And then now that it's here, I have no clue how to navigate this new person. Um, you know, and, and I think also, you know, Tatiana and you, and they've been, I think we're just lucky to be around all these different women who are very driven and so different right like there's something about erica that i i think she's amazing like erica's ability to synthesize everything like we'll have a conversation for an hour like a meeting and then erica will come back with the re- 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 like everything just wrapped up and i'm like and the other day i was like yo you don't have a clone or something because <laughs> yeah, right. you're what <laughs> that's what i'm missing in my company like i need somebody you know and, and there's and I'm always trying to get Willie to come work for us. Always. always. <laughs> like, I'm going like, to tag all of these people that you're calling out. <laughs> I'm always, like, so then, Willie, I'm always making happen. up these projects that I want her to look at. And I'm like, you should totally work with us one day. And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, because, you know, it'd be like, because you, you appreciate and really like me saying that to those people. And I'm always like, Sada, how did you get Sarah to work for you? Because I mean, you would love to work with Sarah and she's like <laughs> stop it <laughs> and I'm saying no but it's true like we've had this conversation um and I think all this shows how lucky we are to be surrounded by such professionals and it's not just about being a professional it's about being inspiring as women um as leaders in your own right and areas which is like Dude, I I can only continue to create and and be because I have no excuse. Like if if ever I'm in need of, you know, like support or ideas or to hire somebody who can get me out of this rut that I can't, like I have all the people around me that could make that happen. So I think that puts you in a unique um, place because this environment is not easy and you need to have that, you know, and I think just the energy from like even the femtech group, you know, we're not meeting as much, but how many incredible businesses come out of femtech Mm -hmm. and how, you know, and, and if you see the way that they're very united and supportive of each other, I think that that's something wonderful. And that speaks to the leadership that's, in front of that and behind that, you know. Um, so yeah, clearly for me, being part of the system mm-hmm. <laughs> is is quite important. And I and I think that it's important for us to continue to create spaces, um, and to to create spaces and and to hold space for other young women to come in and to create businesses and you know to create businesses, but also to be mentored to work for us mm-hmm. um and I, and I also have to remind myself that once I frustrated somebody yes. because I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> because I didn't know what I was doing and I was starting and I had all these dreams and ideas um and to be employing young women you know there's this really amazing young lady that works with us and she's been working with us since she was 19 and you can see her blossoming and changing and something interesting is happening is she's very competent, but now that we're growing, cause she's like an admin, you can tell that it's becoming too much for her cause she doesn't have the, the maturity or, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to, to, for a 21 year old to, to do the admin for a company that is starting to grow like we are. And so recently we actually asked her, was like, so 
what other areas are you interested in? Because I think it's time for you to make a move to another area of the company for now. Um, because this is becoming, we, we don't feel like you need to be let go, but we feel like you need to be in an area that is going to let you to continue to shine. Because this is kind of unfair that because we're growing, you're not, you're, you've stopped shining. Mm -hmm. Because we've seen what you can do. So it's not about you being competent. I think it's just the situation. And so she's in this process of trying to identify. And we know that we have to get an admin that's a lot more mature and can, can, can do more. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, the beauty of change and growth, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can't stay in the same spot forever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do justice and do like a beautifully succinct <laughs> summary. But um, <laughs> as we close, uh, some things that really uh, are staying with me are um, everything we've talked about around transformation, transformation of yourself, transformation and shifts um, around identity. Um, making space for other people's transformations um, and I think that that flexibility and ability to kind of allow for expansiveness is, is really powerful um, and then when you talk about sisterhood uh, I said this I always say this in fact and I said it in one of the previous videos that I feel like I collect awesome women. So I completely agree with you. Um, <laughs> we are surrounded by so many. We're very, very lucky. Um, and thank you to you for being one of them and for all the ways in which you um, receive from the sisterhood you're also giving. So thank you for your inspiration and your wisdom and um, the space that you hold for others. And thank you for sharing space with me here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And also, I think it's reciprocal that your energy is definitely something that I appreciate. And I'm glad that our paths cross because it, it does bring an important energy in. And also, I think an interesting lens of the way that you work and how, you know, I think for us, it was interesting because, you know, like business is such a male world, right? And the energy is very male and macho. And you have like this very softness about you. But it doesn't mean that softness means that equals weakness or that you don't get things done. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, it's a softness that, that allows you to have more compassion maybe in the workplace and, and say that, you know, being a human in the workplace isn't a weakness it's actually a strength and and so thank you for that lens i think that's very important it's a very important reminder to all of us because when you get caught up in making the numbers work right that can quickly go out the window right. quickly very and it's important to have that reminder i think thank you i appreciate that you're welcome i'm going to <laughs> hit end recording now